Uh, hello everyone, uh, this is Ji Wei Liu from University of Pittsburgh. Uh, so first, uh, I need to apologize that we cannot make it to the conference, so we are very, very sorry about that. Uh, I'm very honored to have this opportunity to present our approach uh, for the Microsoft Malware Classification Challenge on behalf of my team. So first, a few words about us. Uh, I am a PhD student uh, majoring in computer architecture. Uh, Xu Erchen uh, is about to be a PhD student uh, next semester of bioinformatics. And our team leader, uh, Xiao Zhou Wang, uh, is a data scientist. Uh, before this challenge, we have zero background uh, of malware classification, so we think we are really, really lucky. Uh, so here's the outline for today's talk. I will first briefly introduce the background of the challenge, and then I will spend most of the time talking about the feature engineering part uh, of, the, of our approach. And uh, then I will uh, discuss the modeling part, and uh, at last I will conclude the talk. Okay, so uh, in this challenge, we are given 10,000 malwares in the training set and test set each. So there are nine classes of malwares. Uh, the total data size is huge, so it's about to be five gigabytes. So for each uh, malware, we are given two types of files. So the bytes file, which is shown here, um, basically each line starts with an address followed by a sequence of bytes. And we are also given, by, uh, we are also given this uh, ASM file, which is produced by a commercial Dissembler IDA Pro, uh, which is shown here. So there are comments and um, declaration of variables and instructions, of course. So the goal of this challenge is to classify these malwares into nine classes, uh, which is evaluated by this multi-class logarithmic loss. Okay, so uh, the overview of our approach uh, for the feature engineering part, uh, we built three, uh, relatively speaking, golden features so optical count, segment count, and pixel in density produced uh, from ASM files. So I will uh, talk about these, uh, how these features are built in detail later. So we also use some other features uh, inspired by published works. And uh, for the modeling part, our approach is heavily based on XGBoost, uh, which is a multi-thread uh, package for the gradient boosting. And uh, we also use ensemble and semi-supervised learning. Uh, our best submission uh, is an ensemble of three XGB models with different feature sets and different uh, parameters. Um, and on top of this ensemble, we apply this semi-supervised learning to further reduce um, uh, the log loss. So uh, we, ch we achieved the public leaderboard log loss and private leaderboard log loss here. And uh, our local cross-validation log loss is very close to the score of the leaderboard. So uh, because we don't have the true labels of the test set, so we can only evaluate the accuracy of the model locally, so which is shown here. So we achieve 99.83% accuracy in the cross-validation. Um, so the general methodology of our approach is very simple. So because we don't have much background uh, in this field, so we just try a lot of things in the feature engineering part and in the modeling part um, based on published work, published works, or our intuitions and observations. And we just use cross-validation to guide us um, to build our models because uh, we find cross-validation is really, really stable, reliable, and precise in this case. So uh, specifically for the feature engineering part, um, after we create features, uh, we apply this random forest feature selection stage because in most cases, uh, the feature sets is very sparse and has very large dimensionality. So uh, that's why we need this feature selection stage to make the feature set denser. And of course, uh, we use cross-validation to make the final choice, so which feature sets to keep for our uh, models. So uh, here, uh, here is the first golden features 
uh, of our model, so uh, the opcode ngram features. Uh, so as shown here, it's a snipped uh, of the ASM file. So basically, each line starts with the keyword uh, indicating the segment type, and followed by an address and several bytes and opcodes and opcodes. So we are interested in the opcode because uh, it is actually instructions which defines the behavior of the malware. So that's why um, uh, we want to build ngram features based on this opcode. So we use a very simple criterion to define so what is an opcode candidate. So it is that we just use the first um, the first tokens in the line that is not a bytes. So it's a very coerced criterion, but at the same time we don't this approach doesn't rely on any external uh, resource or domain knowledge, so it's com completely self-contained to extract uh, the interesting opcode. So uh, the idea is based on the a priori algorithm, which was originally to use to select uh, the frequent uh, n item sites. So, however, the idea is very similar. So the the general idea is, if we want to generate uh, K plus one uh, frequent item set, uh, we need to first have a K plus one candidate set. And uh, this K plus one candidate set should be built on top of a K frequent item sets. So in our case, if we want to build uh, N gram features based on, I'm sorry, if we want to build N plus one gram features uh, based on the uh, the ngram features, so the that ngram features has to be frequent itself. So uh, so our approach uh, is based on this uh, idea. So specifically, uh, uh, we select the uh, uh, one gram of code. So what is the um, base for our ngram feature? generation. So the criterion we come up with is uh, the opcode has to appear more than 200 times in at least one file. So it has to be at least frequent uh, in at least one file. So that's very simple. And uh, a thing we did when we select this one gram feature is we detect, uh, we didn't follow the natural order of the instructions. So we detect the forever loop so which is defined by the unconditional jump instructions such as JMP or JA. So if the opcode lives within this loop, uh, we multiply its count by 10. Um, we did this because uh, if, even if an uh, opcode is infrequent in the file, but if it is in the loop, it is actually executed much, much more frequent then it appears in the text. So um, that's the intuition behind this uh, uh, approach. So in this way, we have uh, we have selected 165 opcodes uh, in the end for the entire training data set. So um, based on this one gram feature, we can further build two grams, three grams, and four grams. So here uh, we build all the possible, we count all the possible two grams. And, but for three grams and four grams, we only select the most frequent ones using a threshold, a similar threshold approach as before. Uh, a different thing here is uh, when counting two, three, and four grams, we no longer consider the forever loop uh, I introduced in the last slide because um, Actually, the reason is the CV log loss is bad if we did that. But we found that just the, the simple natural order for 234 grams uh, gives the best performance. So we ignore all the jump instructions, uh, all kinds of jump instructions. So uh, for the second type, golden feature, so it's called the segment count, uh, which basically means how many lines uh, in each malware are belong to each different segment. 
uh, we count, uh, for example, we count how many dot text uh, lines in this malware. So, um, so uh, actually, there are uh, 40, uh, 448 different types of segments in the entire training set. So, uh, uh, so yeah. In in conclusion, so we have uh, built this um, uh, seventy thousand um, opcode and gram features and uh, four hundred and forty eight segment count features. So this feature set is very very sparse, and um, uh, we use this uh, random classifier to do the feature selection. Uh, the the reason uh, one Another reason is that we find that XGBoost um, doesn't perform uh, equally well with sparse features, so it performs better with dense features. So, um, so after this selection stage, we have uh, 4,000 opcode and gram features left, and only 19 segment count features left. So uh, this slide shows the importance uh, of the top 10 most important opcode and gram features. So the most important features overall is this 4 gram, feature, four gram opcode, so which is pop add, pop return. And um, um, the most important, this feature uh, is a, a 2 gram feature, but which is also very important, which is compare and G and Z. So uh, yeah, we can also see here. So we have this foreground feature, which is semicolon DD, semicolon align. So this is because our criterion is coerced. So the semicolon is not actually an opcode, but we select it anyway. So it should be a two gram feature instead. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. So it's uh, the y-axis stand for the importance of each feature. Okay, so this slide shows the most important 10 segment count features. So the most important overall is the header. So how many lines starts with keyword header in the malware. So it's very important. And um, so there are other uh, important keywords. Uh, so uh, we don't actually understand so uh, what each uh, keyword means because we don't have the this domain knowledge. However, we found that uh, it is okay uh, to not know about that. So the the this approach is completely data driven. So it's um uh, we don't we don't really need to to know that. So yeah, but yeah, of course I agree that uh, to understand why it is important, we need to understand we need to know so we, what each keyword means. So uh, uh, the last golden feature, the ASM file pixel intensity feature, is a very interesting one. So uh, it is inspired by this great work, uh, malware image visualization and automatic classification by uh, Dr. Lakshmanan. Um, this work is based on uh, feature extraction from the bytes file. So the bytes file we have seen in above slides. However, uh, our idea, which is I think new, is um, we extract features from the ASM text file. So the trick here is, excuse me, um, the trick here is we read um, this text file as if it is a binary file and we can generate an image based on this. Um, so for example, so here is the original image generated from the bytes file and here is the image from the ASM file of the same malware. So obviously, obviously they are very different. So all the patterns in the bytes files are gone uh, in the ASM file, but if you look at it closely, I think you could see there are actually subtle texture patterns in the ASM file. So um, based on our cross-validation, we find that the first 800 pixels, the pixel intensities of these first 800 pixels 
are very useful features. So this is another thing uh, different from previous approach. So in previous approach, uh, image processing techniques such as segmentation and uh, Gabor filtering uh, and so on are applied to the image to extract the features. So we actually try the same thing here. However, we find that uh, simply using the pixel intensities are good enough. So. Um, yeah, so so far we don't really understand so why it works, so why why it is so, but it just uh, uh, complements, I think, uh, our other features really, really well uh, for, for our models. So uh, we also build other features, so largely based on the idea of this paper, so a scalable multi-level feature extraction technique to detect malicious executables. So specifically, we build uh, one gram and four gram of the bytes uh, instead instead of the opcode, and um, also function names, so-called derived assembly features. So in total, uh, it is about uh, fifteen thousand features, and then we also apply this random forest um, selection. So we have a uh, two thousand features left. In summary. Um, uh, our final feature set include uh, 4,000 opcode and gram features, 19 segment count features, uh, 800 ASM file pixel and density features, and 2,000 uh, other features. Uh, here is an uh, SNE visualization, so which is used to visualize high dimensional data in a two dimensional uh, image. So uh, the interesting thing here is, uh, so first we can see the features are quite useful to separate each class. And uh, another thing is the feature, uh, the features are really nonlinear. So for example, uh, we can find class three here, here, but also here and here. And we can find class seven here and also here. So uh, this indicates uh, this data set or this feature space is both sparse and nonlinear. So that's a, that's a challenge. So that's why um, we find that after our random forest, this random forest selection stage, the performance is better. So um, Based on this observation, so this nonlinearity uh, could be exploited by a nonlinear classifier like tree based classifier. So here we use XGBoost, uh, which stands for Extreme Gradient, gradient Boost, uh, developed by Tian Chi Chen and Bing Xu. So this is a very, very popular package in the uh, Kaggle machine learning computations. So there are uh, many virtues of this uh, tool. So for example, it automatically uh, exploits this nonlinear uh, feature space and capture the subtle um, interactions of features. And also it is invariant to the monotonic transformations, which means we, can, we don't need to normalize or scale or pre-process our features, our count features and, and pixel intensity features. We can just use them as is. So it's very convenient. And um, it also provides this softmax objective uh, function to optimize um, the multi-class log loss. And um, yeah, another uh, virtue is to automatically impute missing values, which we don't use in this case because uh, we generate all the um, we generate all the features ourselves, so there are no missing values here. And uh, last but not least, uh, this package is multi-threaded, so it is very fast. It's faster than any other classifiers we have tried. So uh, for the ensemble, we build three different models. So these three different models use different feature sets, um, different combination of feature sets, and different uh, hyperparameters. So their performance, uh, cross-validation performance, are similar, but they uh, they complement each other very well. So uh, the ensemble is actually a weighted geomian of these three models. So the weights are also uh, uh, 
uh, found by the great search in cross-validation. So here it shows the performance of the single models uh, with different uh, feature sets. Uh, start, uh, we start uh, with this ngram opco features, so uh, we achieve cross-validation and public leaderboard log loss of 0 0.014 and uh, private leaderboard 0 0.01. If we add this segment count features, so the log loss is reduced greatly. So this is very interesting because if you remember, there are only 19 segment uh, features uh, in the end, but there are 4,000 opcode features, but adding these 19 features can reduce the log loss by 0 0.005 or yeah, roughly. So it's very um, it's a very huge reduction. And um, um, if we apply, if we apply uh, I'm very sorry, so uh, this third group is supposed to be opcode plus segment plus pixel intensity. I'm very sorry about that. It should be, it, it is not the, um, the legend is not showing well here. So this third one, uh, I will write, okay, all right. So it's, uh, this third one is plus pixel. Okay. Um, so, okay. So uh, after, so after uh, adding this uh, 800 pixel intensity features, we can further reduce the log loss. So it's also to a significant amount. So if we use all the feature sets, so all three golden features and other features, uh, we can achieve uh, our best single model can achieve this 0 0.003 log loss in the private leaderboard. So uh, here is the confusion matrix of our best single model, so which use all the three golden features and all the other features. So the column names are uh, stand for predicted class and the row names stand for excuse me. Row names stand for actual class. And um, so the diagonal um, cells stand for the number of instances uh, that are cl uh, correctly classified and uh, all the other cells, the number in all the other cells stand for the instances that are misclassified. So uh, first we can see that for class 1, 3, 4, and class 7, actually our model achieved 100 percent accuracy so there's no misclassification for these four classes. and. Um, the um, for class eight and nine, so we have uh, the most misclassification here. So it's um, so there are uh, five uh, instances from class nine is misclassified to be class eight. So um, in the later part of the com uh, of the computation, so we find that um, this prediction accuracy is pretty much fixed, so we can do nothing to change it. So our focus shifted to uh, reduce log loss um, without being able to improve accuracy. Okay, so that's why um, uh, this semi-supervised learning uh, works really well, because, yeah, another reason is because we already have such a, a model with such a high accuracy, so that's really give us uh, an opportunity to uh, exploit this semi-supervised learning. So the idea is, is also very straightforward. So we first fit the training data and we predict, we generate predictions for the test data. And then uh, we generate the pseudo labels for the test data set based on predictions. So specifically, um, out of the nine uh, probabilities, nine uh, prediction probabilities for nine classes, uh, we label the test, the instance in the test set uh, with the class that has the largest probability. Okay, I, I hope I make myself <laughs> clear. So um, after we have these pseudo labels, so we can uh, predict each subset of test data again 
with uh, the training data combined with other parts of the test data with pseudo labels. So for example, uh, if we uh, divide the test set into four parts, A, B, C, and D. So uh, first we use training data to generate pseudo labels for test set A, B, C, and D. And then uh, we predict uh, set uh, A again using uh, the training data and the test set B, C, and D. So, uh, and we can do this in a cross-validate uh, fashion to uh, generate the final predictions. So, um, so uh, here we uh, examine the performance of the single models, ensemble models, and the ensemble plus semi-supervised learning models. <clears throat> so uh, this best single model is the model that uses all the golden features and uh, all the features actually. So uh, this ensemble model achieves the same um, private leaderboard log loss, but it reduces cross validation and public leaderboard log loss significantly. And uh, on top of this ensemble is we if we apply the semi supervised learning. Um, Although we don't improve public leaderboard, we reduce local uh, cross-validation and we also reduce uh, private leaderboard. So it's, uh, uh, it, it actually works very well. So the thing I need to uh, point out is actually these three models, they have the same or very, very close classification accuracy, but uh, the difference is the log loss is optimized by ensembling and semi-supervised learning. Okay, uh, so in conclusion, uh, in this challenge, we built several uh, new features, and um, uh, specifically uh, the segment count features and ASM file pixel density features. So uh, our observation is that the feature space is very sparse and nonlinear. So, which is best exploited by the um, tree-based classifiers. So, uh, an XG boost uh, really, really does a wonderful, amazing job here. So, I think the top three teams all use XG boost. So, uh, if you have any questions or comments, you can ask them, I guess. And um, uh, we also come up with this semi-supervised learning trick to further reduce the log loss. And um, yeah, so because uh, in this uh, last but not least, the cross-validation is really, really important. Because we don't actually have, this data size is actually small. Because, because there are only 10,000 instances in the training and test each. And in the public leaderboard, there are only 3,000. So that's actually quite small data set, which encourages people to overfit. So, uh, however, yeah, we are so lucky that uh, during the entire process, our cross validation is so stable and reliable, and um, um, we really uh, tr uh, we chose to trust our local cross validation. So, which is uh, the the most most important reason uh, for our win. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for your time, and uh, I, I need to apologize again, I cannot do a live Q&A session, so uh, if you have any questions, any comments, any feedback, please contact me through the email, and uh, uh, I also list my Kaggle uh, profile, so you can also find me there. Uh, so last, I, I want to say, I want to thank Kaggle and Microsoft for holding this wonderful contest. And um, I'm really looking forward um, uh, to participate uh, more in these contests and uh, contribute more to the machine learning community. Thank you very much.